All right. Well, welcome back. Last session. Uh, I'll quote the great theological group, Salt and Peppa. Let's talk about sex, baby. Uh, so, yeah. Some of us need our minds sanctified and renewed. Remember, put off the old and put on the new. So, uh, all right. Hey, let me pray, and then let's get going with this last session on, on sex. Lord, thank you um, that, again, you're here. You haven't left us. Thank you for the provision. You gave us way more uh, food than, than we needed. Uh, thank you so much for that. You haven't forgotten about us. Uh, and thank you that you care about, care about sex and you care about how uh, that good gift uh, gets used. And uh, thank you that you, you have the ability to, to speak to us in this, in this area. So we want to hear from you. We love you. Amen. All right, so we ended our time by talking about... This, this session probably is going to be a little shorter, um, and then we'll do Q&A longer at, at the end. Um, our church intentionally... Uh, church 21 is the name of it, so church21.ca uh, is our website. Um, we intentionally talk about sex in the month of September. I shared this last night as well. Um, we, we deal with pretty normal subjects or have dealt with pretty normal subjects around sex, but this year we're, we're doing some things that we haven't uh, done before because the need is there. So we talked about the origins of sex. We talked about sexual abuse, which we've never preached on really before. And yet the amount of feedback we got from that sermon was, one, it was really hard. Two, I think we could have done it better. Uh, but three, this was needed to be talked about, um, especially in, in Montreal where um, uh, everyone has a sexual abuse case uh, with the church some, in some way, shape, or form. Um, we talked about uh, polyamory or poly relationships because um, – 5% of current relationships, like committed relationships, are polyamorous. So one in 20 people uh, are in that type of relationship. And so that's, that's already here. Uh, and then we talked about virtual and digital uh, pornea. So if those type of, of subjects can could, could be of any help to you, you can listen to our podcast around this. This is just going to be a, a short snippet about sex. But I think the church has done... Um, the, the big C church, overall church, I think we've done a pretty poor job discipling people when it comes to sex. Uh, I think it's one of those things that we're not quite sure what to do with. Um, we're not sure what Song of Solomon completely means, and so uh, we don't want the illustrated kids version of that going out, right? Um, and so we, we don't talk about it all that much, we, and, and we hope that everyone's just kind of going to figure it out, but they don't figure it out. And so what ends up happening is people go outside of the church to be discipled when it comes to sex, and that's really unfortunate because sex is, is from God. Sex is actually his idea. It wasn't something that we came up with. We're looking at the Lego pieces like, how does this all fit together? Oh, like God actually intended for it to work the way that it does, and we should be talking about it. And it's really important as we do uh, pre-marriage counseling that we're talking about sex because people have loads of questions about it and loads of ideas and expectations. And uh, people have histories with, with, with sex and their ideas of what it's going to be like. And so one of the things that we do in our church is we do one to two weeks before, um, before someone gets married, we do this session on sex with them. But then uh, if it's my wife and I that we're doing the counseling, I offer to meet with the guy one-on-one. -on -one. She offers to meet with the, the female one-on-one. -on -one. And I just say, you can ask me any question you want about sex. Like, I do not get embarrassed when it comes to this stuff. Like, you cannot ask me a question that's going to make me blush at all. And so um, maybe that's feeding your, your Q&A time, right, at the end. <laughs> like, let's see if we can make this guy blush. Um, don't do that. Listen, I've been here. I've been talking a long time, all right? I just want to go home. <laughs> no. Uh, no, this is, that's fine. But... Um, but I think it's really important because people do have questions, and they don't ask them because they don't have a place to ask them. And who's going who's gonna to do that in a Sunday gathering where it's like, oh, we're talking about sex. Who has a question about sex? Someone's going to ask some random thing, but people aren't going to have the opportunity to ask their questions about it. So please think about how do we create a culture where we're able to do this. And going back to what we talked about earlier around the family, you know, if we can push this stuff down into the family and not not think by doing a sermon series once a year or once a decade, that's going to solve all the problems um, because we're being inundated with this stuff all the time. Okay, that was all preamble. I'm getting chatty, apparently, in the early afternoon. Uh, put some Costco croissant sandwiches in me, and I'm ready to go. 
All right, uh, communication. We talked about communication at the end, speaking. Communication is also important as it pertains to sex. We need to be talking about uh, sex. I already shared a lot of this stuff, but the world is all about sex, is it not? Right? Everything is sexual. You watch your kids' movies. They've put so many sexual innuendos that, like, they're going over my kids' heads, but they're all there, right? They're all there. The world is always talking about it. The world shows up like the serpent every time. Genesis 3, did God really say this? If there is a God, did God really say this? So let me ask a few questions. Don't answer. Might get very awkward if you answer, okay? Um, But how did you learn about sex? How did you learn about sex? Um, For me, it was uh, my grampy. He had a, down in his basement, he uh, I don't know why, but he decided to post up bunches of pictures uh, all along the wall. So I remember being like seven or eight years old, heading downstairs. He had really cool snowmobiles too that I would sit on, and I would sit on these snowmobiles. And I like the snowmobiles way more than p- the pictures. But I'm like sitting on the snowmobile, thinking about what it'd be like to drive, and I'm looking at all these pictures on the wall, trying to process through like what, like these women should have their shirts on. Like what is going on? I don't understand. Um, and then you know, coming across certain videos in fourth grade and like, oh, this is very strange. I don't understand this. Um, Learned about sex very young. And that's a reality. So many people are learning about sex at very young ages, but we as adults think that, oh, I don't know if my 12-year-old can be listening to this sermon or talk about sex. I'm like, your 12-year-old knows a lot more about sex or thinks they know a lot more about sex than you probably think that they do. But how did you learn about sex? Is it, how accurate was it? My understanding of sex was not accurate, right? I saw stuff happening, but I didn't understand the way that sex had really been designed. Currently, how do you learn about sex? How do you learn about sex? And lastly, do you have positive or negative thoughts or associations about sex? I, I know that when I talk about sex, there are people in the room every time that have very negative associations and bad experiences with sex. And I'm so sorry that that has happened. And that's the reality. But if we're going to make disciples, we need to talk about sex. And we need to understand God's purposes for sex. So let me read a few verses in Genesis 1 and in Genesis 2. Um, in my, when my wife and I were going through premarital counseling, uh, the guy just kept going through Genesis 1 to 3 every time we'd meet with him. I'm like, why do you keep going through Genesis 1 to 3? You did this last time. And he's like, like all of your life is going to be returned back to Genesis 1 to 3. Like everything is repeating around this. But Genesis 1, 26 to 28 says, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the heaven, the livestock, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps in the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, multiply. How do you multiply? Sex. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over every living thing that moves on the earth. So God sets all this up. He oversees all of it. God is not embarrassed by sex either. He sees all this, looks at it, and like an accountant says in verse 31, God saw everything he had made, and behold, it was very good. Sex is very good up till this point. Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 says, The Lord God commanded the man, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. From the day that you eat of that, you shall surely die. Then the Lord God said, it's not good the man should be alone. We talked about this last night, didn't we? Uh, I will make him a helper fit for him. So out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every bird of the heavens, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock, birds of the heavens, beasts of the field. But for Adam, there was found no helper fit for him. So God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. While he slept, took one of his ribs, closed up its place with flesh. And the rib the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, they shall become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. See, sex isn't dirty. It's not dirty. It's a good gift. It actually brings God glory. 
premarital counseling sessions and we talk about sex, I, I look at the couple and I said, hey, so when you're in your honeymoon and you're having sex together, do you know where God is? It gets really awkward because they haven't thought of that. <laughs> They're like, I know the right theological answer, but I don't know if I want to answer you or think about that. I'm like, he's right there. And I'm like, and this brings him glory. He's for you. Like, he's, he's glad that you're enjoying each other in this way, that he wants you to live naked and unashamed. But he gave boundaries to sex. And he gave boundaries for life. In chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, it became very clear, or it's very clear to us, that he wanted for humanity to listen to him. Don't try and figure truth out on your own. Don't look around and, and base things on just what you see. Like, listen to what the Lord has to say, and you will live. You will find value, meaning, and purpose forever listening to what the Lord has to say. That's a good boundary. The other boundary that we see is this one fleshness, that sex is supposed to be experienced in this one flesh relationship. This is why polygamy is jacked. This is why polyamory doesn't work. This is why polytheism doesn't work, that God designed us for one flesh. And we're protected and designed, sex is protected and designed for a covenantal one flesh experience. And in all of Scripture, all of Scripture, we're never given the authority to change that. Now, during our September series, we have loads of non-Christians that come to hear what we're going to talk about, about sex. And that's one of the, the wildest claims is that the Bible never, ever says, okay, I designed sex this way, but now I'm giving it over to you to do what you want with, when, whomever you want, however you want. We're never given that authority. We're given authority to have dominion over the fish, over all this stuff, but we're never given dominion to figure out sex on our own. It's given to us as a gift, as it is. But today, what we experience is sex really being with however and whomever we want. So what changed? This isn't going to be uh, news to you. We've been talking about this, but Genesis 3, 1 to 6, everything broke. Everything broke, and since that time, we've been searching for life. And sex is one of the places where we, even as Christians, we search for life. We think that a better relationship is going to be found in sex. But when we look for life in creation, when we look for creation to bring us the value, meaning, and purpose that only God can, it leaves us disappointed. Uh, Genesis 3, 7, and 8 says, then the eyes of both were open. They knew they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together, made themselves loincloths. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. When we were looking for life in creation, for value, meaning, and purpose, even within sex, it leaves us disappointed. In this instance, they were, they were hiding from relationship and responsibility. We looked at them blaming and broken. But one of the things that happens as it pertains to sex is we become perverted. Um, one, one year when we did our September series, sometimes I don't think before I speak. Um, and so like I popped up on stage, we're meeting at a, a big theater. I popped up on the stage and I'm like, good morning, perverts. And like awkward laughter. And I think one person got up to leave. I'm like, no, 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 come back. It's okay. It's going to be fine. Um, but what I, wanted is, what I wanted to get at was what I'm going to talk about today is that we're all, we're all perverted. The, the word pervert comes with sexual connotations, but truly to be perverted is to be corrupt, to be bent away from how we were made to be. And everything and all of us in one way, shape, or form are perverted. In that, in, in that moment, in the garden, that perversion took place, we began pursuing everything with self-love, which we talked about a little bit last night too, and that includes sex. For so many of us still, we pursue sex for self-love. We pursue sex to meet my desires and my needs. And we're told that we have, we're sexual beings, we have sexual needs, and it's not our fault. This is what we're getting from our society and from all the professionals. It's not your fault. And if you're not having that met, it's your spouse or your partner or your lack of partner, that's, that's the fault. You just go out and pursue self-love however you can. Paul Tripp says sex is dangerous when it's only motivated by the love of you. Sex is dangerous when it's only motivated by the love 
of you. And so how does self-love get expressed sexually? And I'm not just talking about sex out there. I'm talking about Christian relationships. Well, it shows up in, in porn. So many Christians addicted to porn. If you're addicted to porn, please get help for that. Um, it shows up in, in rape, taking something that's not yours. It shows up in, in fantasies. It shows up in, in hookups. It shows up in polyamory. It shows up in, in abuse, right? Self-love is, is dominating the whole sexual landscape. It's taken something that was made for a very specific reason and purpose and to be beautiful, and people are applying it however they want for their good. Um, Tinder, never gone on Tinder, never, like, full confession, don't know much about it. Um, But I do know that Tinder doesn't exist so you can swipe to serve someone, right? Like, who can I serve selflessly today? It's like, it's, capitalistic commodities that you're just flying through to see who can I use and they can use me because we're both sexual beings. It's all pursued out of self-love. And you can't unpursue self-love on our own. You can't do it. You can't say, stop loving yourself. It'll, it'll show up in different ways where you're still pursuing self-love. Self-love will keep rising up in your marriage But the good news that we've been looking at over the past day is that Jesus came for the pervert. Jesus came for us. He came for the broken. And he came to replace our self-love with a love for him and a love for others. And he came to make us just like him. In Mark chapter 10, verse 45, he says, the son of man didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus is saying, I I came to serve, not to be served. And now I'm calling you my friends, my people, and I'm going to send you out into this world as servants. And if that's true of like serving your coworkers and your neighbors and people at the grocery store, and if, if that's our calling in all of life, then most certainly it applies to our spouse. And most certainly it applies to sex, that we're servants really in all of life. So what happens when we understand the gospel in the the whole sexual realm is that sex moves from fulfilling our desire primarily to now satisfying the other person. That's wild, isn't it? That it it moves from, oh, I'm going to have all my desires taken care of to what do you want? What would be helpful for you? How can I serve you? Marriage isn't a call to sex, but service. Marriage isn't a call to sex, but a call to service. Sex is not something to be withheld as punishment or given as a reward or demanded. If that's your type of relationship you have, please confess that to one another and get some help in better understanding what sex is actually supposed to be used for. See, because sex is actually a gift that we steward. Serving our spouse for the glory of Jesus. Serving them in a way that is significantly pleasurable for the glory of Jesus. And it's a gift that reveals your heart. Is sex only on your terms? Is it only when you feel like it? Is it only how you want? Or are you serving your spouse with it? You see, marriage where both spouses live as if sex really isn't about them, but the other way, that sex is going to be amazing. When both spouses are saying, I'm here to serve you. No, I'm here to serve you. It's like, we got all night. That's going to be great. Or all afternoon, or all morning, whatever. Right? We have time. Read Song of Solomon. It's like a multi-day thing happening, apparently. But that'll be amazing. It'll be amazing where you're, you're, there, you're there to serve the other person. And serving sexually involves being transparent and will need lots of conversation. It needs conversation before sex happens. Some of you have, have kids. Kids make it complicated, right? You all got kids because you were having fun, but then once you have kids, it makes it complicated. Um, so you're going to need to discuss what, 
what and when and how and what are we going to do and where are kids going to be and how's this all going to work out and I'm usually tired at this time or I'm whatever, right? Have conversation beforehand. Talk about the past, right? This is what we want to do in pre-marriage counseling too is what, what's your understanding of sex been? Um, what, what are you bringing into the marriage and how can we work through some of this beforehand? Um, some people have been told that like sex is really bad, don't have sex, I uh, can't have sex, don't think about sex, don't anything about sex. And then just before marriage, we're like, hey, you're going to get married. Now sex is going to be great. And they said that was a really hard switch for them. They've been told their whole life, don't do this, fight against this, fight against any desire. Your desire is even bad. And then like, oh, go for it. It'll be amazing. A lot of counseling around that. But we have conversation before sex. Have conversation during sex. How do you feel? Are you okay? Everything, is there anything that you'd like, right? I'm not going to get super practical here, but you can imagine the type of conversation that can be had during, during sex. And then after, don't just, oh, all right, done. That was great. Keep talking. Allow for that to carry over into emotional intimacy. Most men, most men, okay, generalizing, really like the physical aspects. Most women really like the emotional aspects, right? Allow for both of those things to be intertwined throughout the sex. This is a, a very unique way for this one flesh relationship to show love. Um, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up. If you're here in dating, if you're here and you're engaged, you might be thinking, how does sex fit into my life? It doesn't. And, um, you know, we get, like, really smart people. Uh, McGill University, we, we minister to a lot of McGill students. They're like, they ask me questions like, well, what does sex really mean? I'm like, well, if you're asking that question, don't go anywhere near it, right? Like, yeah, but what, what is really sex? Like, like, what is it? And I'm like, well, how graphic do I need to be around this? Because what we're looking for is loopholes. What, how far can I go? without going against what God has said, this, this you can't do. I'm like, ah, oh, your heart's already on the way there, though. And Jesus talked way more about the heart than the action. So let's deal with your heart. Let's deal with your heart. And I just say that lovingly. And I remember being extremely frustrated. I got married when I was uh, 27. And I remember that it's like, I didn't want to wait till I was 27, you know? And it just wasn't a thing to be had. Uh, Song of Solomon, the, the woman who, um, who's married, says to her young friends, um, don't awaken love before it's time. Don't awaken love. Don't allow for certain aspects of intimacy to open up before it's time. And that whole, I, I heard a preacher years ago talking about uh, like foreplay, that we're basically asking the question of, like, how much foreplay can I have without actually playing? And he's like, well, foreplay is kind of like the on-ramp to a highway. He said, no one is like, I'm going to go as fast as I can, as far as I can down that on-ramp, and then I'm going to back up. It's like the on-ramp is meant to get going so that you're able to speed onto the highway. And he said, foreplay is just like that. It's meant to get things going. It's not meant to... Like, get as far as you can, stop, and then come back. It's just not for you. Don't take it now. Um, you taking it now is also taking it from someone else, and it's not even theirs to give to you. That's a, a gift from the Lord to them to be able to give to the person that they're going to enter into this covenantal relationship with. And if you've already been involved in this before marriage, oh, the Lord, that was my story too. And the Lord can bring healing, and the Lord can reset, and the Lord can, can work through all of, those, all of those things. If you've been hurt sexually or hurt others sexually, uh, there's hope. There's so much hope. There's healing for you. And if that's you, if you've hurt others sexually or you've been hurt sexually, please get help with that. You have pastors and ministry leaders and small group leaders and hope groups and people that would love to care for you. And if they can't, well, certainly they can connect you to, to people who can care for you in more profound ways. Forgiveness and restoration is possible because of the gospel, but, but get help, and you're not alone. 
Sometimes we feel very alone with our sexual history or currently what we're dealing with, and you're just not alone. So many people are dealing with the same things that you are, and it's one of the lies that we believe is that no one is going through what we're going through. No one can understand. They most certainly can. So marriage, how do I wrap up this whole thing? Marriage is a call to be naked and unashamed. Marriage is a call to be naked and unashamed. Regardless of what you've done or what you're working through, there's always an opportunity to reset with one another. Forgiveness, reconciliation, restoration is possible. If Jesus is alive, you're alive, anything is possible. And he is more committed to your relationship than you will ever be. And in your marriage, when you said, I do, you, you also said, I, I do not serve myself primarily anymore. I'm now a servant of my spouse. So I think this is a fitting way to end. That marriage is a call to love and serve your spouse. And as we do this, we demonstrate how Jesus serves his bride. We get to showcase to the world how Jesus serves his bride. So there's hope for any of you here. There really is. And uh, I know that this team of, of ministry leaders are really, the reason why this is happening uh, is not because they were bored and were like, yeah, our people usually have nothing to do on a Friday and Saturday. Um, so like, why don't we just throw together this thing? I know a guy who wrote this thing. Like, why don't we put it together? It was because, oh, we really care about the marriages in our church and we know that there are some marriages that are, that are going through some difficulties, and there are some that want to be married, and they have questions. So why don't we put this on? Because we're ready to, to, heal, to, to minister and to lean in and care for these people. And so this thing has been put on to care for you. And not that this was the care. This is the beginning of it. And so if there are conversations that the Spirit of God is saying, I want you to have this conversation with your spouse, with your pastor, with your leader, with your whomever, um, don't, don't grieve him. Don't push him aside. Uh, run, run after whatever he's saying because what he wants for you is to, to find all of your identity, value, meaning, purpose, and life in Christ. Whatever he's leading you toward is going to be what's best, even if it's painful. So let me pray for you, and then I'm sure there's no questions. Uh, let me pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you brought... Um, you brought eternal life. You brought a relationship with the Father. You, because of what you've done, we can be adopted into the family of God. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you dwell inside of us. You, have, you reside in us as temples, and we're not static temples. We're moving all the time, and so you want to show and tell of the goodness of who Jesus really is and what he's done as we're living our normal lives. But I pray for marriages. I pray for marriages that are going so well. Oh, would you root those in the gospel and help them to have years and years of, of incredible fruit? May you multiply uh, through them a gospel effectiveness with one another and into others. I pray that you would have mentor couples here uh, that would be able to mentor those who are, who are newly married. I'm gonna pray for uh, marriages that seem hopeless, that that because of your resurrection, Jesus, it would spark hope again in them and that they would want to pursue uh, their spouse out of, out of love and out of that one fleshness that they've been, been called to. I pray for those who have been harmed, that if they haven't received healing and hope, that they would pursue that. And I want to pray for all of, the, all of the details, right? There are some answers that we just can't give across the board, but there are very specific circumstances and details that I pray that you would minister to specifically. I pray that this would be a, a church uh, where, where healthy marriage is, is pursued because it brings you honor and glory. And um, we love you. We need you. Thank you for this time together. Amen. Okie dokie. This is the sex q and uh, might be a surprise to some of you, but this is the first time I've ever had to be involved in a sex Q&A. So... <laughs> Anyhow, uh, I'm not like Jordan and Dwight. I don't like awkward silence, but we'll see how it goes. Any questions, folks? Okay. Didn't take long. I'm going to pass that down. Hello. Thank you so much for being here. And mm -hmm. um, obviously, everyone here 
I think has a lot of questions, but it's hard to ask, but um, I got permission for this one. <laughs> I have two, actually. So the first one is um, just what advice do you have for a couple that's engaged, let's say, and, and just a little bit of like context about this. It's obvious that Christians you know, tend to get married really quickly after um, getting engaged. For whatever reason, does God have reasons to prolong engagement and have a season for that maybe um, where it's a lot longer than expected? And for whatever reason, what advice do you have for this couple to kind of persevere? Because um, there's not a lot of advice other than don't have sex for a couple that's engaged, but wondering like how, how I don't know, how, how, how to understand that you're an engaged couple, but, but not able to do a lot, you know, yeah. and not just talking about sex, but there's just a lot of things. Don't hang out alone. Don't, yeah. you know, spend too much time alone. But if this engagement is very long, like, are there reasons why God would n want to do that for, for each person to sure. prepare them maybe? Well, engagement is a man-made creation. It's not in the Bible. Like, we made the engagement thing. Um, so I, what I tell couples is don't be engaged. If you know, like, don't get engaged to someone until you know that you want to marry. This is Dwight wisdom, right? So you can accept or reject this. It doesn't matter. Thus saith Dwight, not the Lord. Um, but um, if you know that's a person that you want to get married to, don't wait any longer than you need to. Engagement is usually like, a, how many people do we want at our wedding? How do we set this thing up? Let's get some premarital counseling. Like when people tell me, oh, we're going to get engaged and we're going to get married in two years. I'm like, what are you going to do in two years? Like, why are you, why are you putting that off uh, that long? So that would be my question, the, the why. You know, why is there something? Um, I've seen engagements get stalled because during the engagement process, something came up and it's like, whoa, I didn't know about that. Now we need some counseling. Now we need to work through this. Do we actually still want to pursue this? I thought this was the person I wanted to marry. But as I said, uh, I think it was last night, when I tell the brides, you sure you want to do this? This is like your last moment before, I don't even ask the groom. Like, it's useless at that point. It's like, sure you want to marry that guy? Um, uh, so, so that would be my advice. Don't, and, and engagement isn't like, oh, we're married in our hearts. Like, no, you're not. Like, that's not a thing. It's not a category. It's not in the Bible. Oh, we're married before God. No, you're not. Like you're not. So there's not a there's not a category, and I think we try and create these loophole categories to be able to do what we want and to redesign things. And and I'm sympathetic to that, but I'm like, well, the answer is, you know, as Paul's talking in First Corinthians seven, like some of you need to get married. You're like burning with desire for one another. Like, let's who cares it? Not like Grandma Joe can't be here. Like, let's get this thing wrapped up and like tell Grandma Joe to send a blender or something later. Like, I don't know. So. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. I have one more quick question. It doesn't sure. have to do with this, with sex, but um, it, you mentioned earlier just how important it is for couples to kind of carve out time during the week or in the day to sit down and connect. And sometimes that can look and feel for most couples a little bit artificial and exhausting to just be so communicative and overly communicative. What advice do you have if one person is more communicative than the other and maybe the other is has a really hard time to articulate feelings and um, doesn't speak as much and it, 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 it's, it's difficult to bond? Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, some of us like to talk a lot. Some of us don't like to talk a lot. or We don't know what sh we should be sharing. Um, so I think it's, again, I'm putting it back on the couple of like, you, if you know, oh, my, my wife has a really hard time talking about what's going on. Um, I, can, I can ask her, can I just ask you questions? Uh, and you tell me if they're helpful questions or not. And I can lodge those in my little brain of like, hey, when we're together, I'm going to ask you these questions and help you articulate uh, this stuff. Um, and I, I, maybe I made it sound too formal, um, but I think it's like an informal time of, you know, maybe you... Um, like most recently, we were watching a documentary on the Tour de France and watching these guys bike. And like, there's not much you have to listen to. You're just like watching the guys bike along. And it's a great opportunity to be watching something, talking. I, I shared last night, like my wife and I both like to run. And so that's been a time where we're communicating as well. Guys like to do things side by side often. Women like to do things face to face. Big generalization. 
But, um, but sometimes that's helpful if, it, if communication is harder. Uh, like, let's do something together. And as you're doing something, like, hey, what were you, this thing came up. What were you feeling about that? Whatever. Um, but I think if there's a regular time where it's like, oh, every night, 7.30, whatever. Like, we're sitting down. And if there's like, oh, there's not much to talk about today, pretty easy day, like, great. What do you want to do tonight? I think it's just easier to just always do things and never have that time. So it's better to have the time that you're just like, oh, we don't need this time. Let's move on to something else than to try and find it. Does that make sense? Okay. Again, church planner, not a marriage expert. <laughs> so, I think to add to that too, as you're developing something as a new discipline, you may want to take, um, you know, be happy with the little parts that you have, and it's something that you'll build in time, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, appreciate. If the person's a quiet person, appreciate the little bit that they share, right? Yeah, yeah that's good. If all of this is, like, new, and you're like, whoa, you know, an hour of conversation. It's like, all right, oh, you've never read your Bible and prayed before? Well, like, go read the Old Testament tomorrow morning and, like, pray for an entire day. Like, you will be asleep drooling on the book of Leviticus, you know, by 8 o'clock. Um, but the idea of like, oh, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a, a verse, or I'm going to read a chapter, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for my family, or I'm going to pray for my neighbor, whatever. Like, start small and, and um, grow into some of this stuff. More questions? kind of a weird one. Uh, <clears throat> back to your go-to, uh, Disney. Disney, okay. Okay, so I think a lot of people know or maybe don't know the subliminal stuff that could or could not be in there, and you alluded to it about it goes over your kids' heads and so sure. forth. Sure. Um, do you want to... Uh, does it go over their head? Does it influence them in any kind of subtle ways that you can see in the future when they're getting out? Hey, how you know? How'd they know that? Maybe it was because of this. And you want to obviously, what is the ratings? Parental guidance and guide them from movie to movie or what have you, or just cold turkey cut. You're not watching nothing. Like, yeah. How do you maneuver in that realm of? innuendo and, and, and subliminal programming or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, we, our practice, and this is what we encourage parents to do, is to watch with your kids. Um, and, no, we don't, we don't pre-watch stuff. Um, we, yeah, we watch things with our, with our kids, and we'll pause, we'll fast forward, we'll talk about... Um, but if we're making disciples and we only say like, oh, these things, these things are good or we don't let you, and again, this is, this is me, um, but we don't ever let you see anything uh, that might be, I'm not talking like porn or something, but the idea that like you're going to watch something that we're going to have to stop and, and talk about. And like, let's process through that. And usually, like right now, it's usually about attitudes of characters. It's about... Um, like boyfriend girlfriend stuff. It's like, why would they pursue that? You know, my 11 year old son is like, you know, why do these 13 year old kids have, you know, boyfriend girlfriend if like relationships are for marriage? I'm like, oh, great question. And like, there's a whole variety of views on this stuff, right? So we, we watch most things, well, not most things, we watch stuff with our kids. We don't just let them go and process things on their own. And we talk about it. And there's some things that we're like, no, we're not watching this stuff, but. I don't know. It's like a, I think it's a parent to parent wisdom, wisdom thing. And you knowing your kids and what are your kids able to handle and what are they not able to handle? Our seven year old daughter can watch scarier things than our 13 year old son. She loves it. You know, she, she loves that idea of like controlled fear and it's not real. My 13 year old son is like, but that thing might exist. <laughs> you know, so it's like, oh, okay, we watch different things. You know, my daughter and I watch Saw together, and no, I'm just joking. Uh, <laughs> no, but it's—I think it's knowing knowing your kids and what they can handle, and and like if your if your if your kids are 
in their teen years and they go to their friends' houses and stuff. Are you actually going to... So what do you guys watch? Type oh, of thing? oh yeah. yeah. So we've already told our kids. This might sound super lame, but my, my oldest son knows my story, like watching porn, all that growing up. Like told him all that. And I said, um, hey, I'm just going to... I'm going to tell where, whoever you're going with uh, at their house. Uh, no phones. And whatever is being watched has to be watched in a common area. And I'm like, that's just our thing. And he's like, no, that's cool. I, that makes complete sense. I don't want that stuff either. So I just tell parents, Christian, non-Christian. I'm like, don't have your kid use their phone or they're not coming back over. They're like, oh, okay, cool. We respect rules and it's never been an issue. But you have to get your kids buy-in on that too, <laughs> right? So it's like they see it as, as a good thing. else. Wow. Great. Great. Well, thank you so much for letting me be here. I really appreciate it. Um, thankful that uh, for those of you who are part of Harvest, we're part of the same church planning network, and, uh, and marriage is one of those things that is going to keep coming up for probably the rest of our lives. And uh, these subjects are, are things that we're going to need to be discipling our, our churches in and speaking about. We can't just talk about planting uh, new works without also talking about the realities of discipleship that go along with it. So glad to be in this together with you, and uh, thank you for this time. Well, thank you. Can we give them a hand clap, guys? Awesome.